All right, so um, yeah, so today I wanted to discuss um, you know, the, the sort of most basic aspects of this generalized Kaler Ricci flow. Um, and so um, maybe maybe to to first sort of motivate the equation, <clears throat> we can first uh, well maybe I just uh, I'll discuss the equation in, in uh, sort of the 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 classical by Hermitian setting, but then also the generalized setting. So so for me, generalized Kähler, at least at first, it will be this this by Hermitian setup where I have the metric and two integrable complex structures, and G is compatible with both. And then I have omega i is uh, g i, omega j is g j, the two Kähler forms. And then we have this um, uh, d, d c i, omega i is what I call h, and this is minus my d c j, omega j. And so, <clears throat> I mean, I think at first blush, if you want to write down uh, like a flow equation that preserves all this is maybe probably not so immediately clear what, what you should do. Um, but the point of course, is that we'll sort of think of it as two, it's, uh, um, and of course I forgot to write down also dh equals zero. So, so the point is to think of it as uh, like two pluriclosed structures. So, so G with the metric I, uh, G, G with the complex structure I, um, is is pluriclosed, but then so is G with the complex structure J, right? So, so it's basically two pluriclosed structures. So what sort of ends up happening is that this pluriclosed flow, uh, you kind of get two two versions of it going on at the same time um, to to produce the the generalized Kähler Ricci flow. So first, let's just recall. Um, This pluriclosed flow, which um, so d omega dt was minus rho bismuth uh, one one. So we had this equation. Um, I won't maybe recall what what this uh, means, uh, but uh, so we discussed that this is equivalent. Uh, basically to, to generalized Ricci flow uh, as follows. So, so the metric evolves by minus twice Ricci plus one half H squared um, uh, minus the Lie derivative with respect to the Lie form of G and del H del T is uh, the Hodge Laplacian of H again, um, minus the Lie derivative with respect to the Lie form of H, okay? And so um, the, the key, well, the, the simplest way to sort of see how to, how to get this uh, generalized Kähler-Ricci flow is to sort of, is to re-gauge. So, um, And so, um, so if I pull back by the diffeo, so in other words, if I, if I have a solution of pluriclosed flow and I pull back by the diffeomorphisms, the one parameter family of diffeomorphisms generated by this time dependent Lie vector field, then I can get a new um, system of equations. So I'll just copy it down again uh, with a certain emphasis. So, so dg dt, is minus twice Ricci plus one half H squared. So, so I'm exactly sort of setting it up to remove this, this gauge parameter, right? This, so th this, um, this, this um, by, by pulling back by this one parameter family, I exactly will knock off uh, this, this term and likewise, likewise this term. And so uh, del H del T, um, 
will just be the Hodge-Laplacian of H. But then for emphasis, um, for emphasis, uh, I'll write down the evolution of the complex structure. So del I del T is L theta um, sharp I. So okay, um, maybe maybe I should uh, just clarify here that this is pluricloused flow on a complex manifold like M two N G uh, I. Okay, so I I is the complex structure here. Okay, so the point is that that this is preserving all of the um, all of the pluricloused uh, conditions. Okay. So this is preserving all of the, so, so this. Um, this preserves the pluricloused conditions for like GT, IT, okay? And once we look at it like this, um, it's maybe, it's maybe easy then to, to guess what should generalized Kähler Ricci flow be. So here, let me just copy and paste. Um, so, so for so for generalized Kähler Ricci flow, here I'm starting with M two N G I. J. And the point is thought of this way, we can just tack on uh, the following del J del T is L theta J sharp of J. And then here, let me decorate this one with an I. Okay. So if we like, we can think of, of uh, of this as uh, as the generalized uh, Kähler Ricci flow system. So basically, what what did I do? Uh, th the whole point is to think of this as kind of two two copies of this generalized Kähler Ricci flow. Uh, uh, sorry, two two copies of this pluricloused flow, like running at the same time. Okay. So here, I mean, I, I didn't decorate the theta with an with an I here, but um, whereas here I, I do for for emphasis. But of course, this is also um, this is also really like theta i, um, if you like. Okay, so um, so let's just give when we sort of set things up this way. The fact that it preserves uh, generalized Kähler is essentially a, a triviality. So um, uh, so this is the theorem. Um, so. So this is so so the theorem is that this system generalized Kähler Ricci flow preserves the generalized Kähler condition. Okay. And uh, yeah, so so let let me just say uh, a few words about about the proof, um, I guess it would be good to keep as much of this on the screen as possible. So um, so you can think of it like this, uh, given uh, G naught, I naught, uh, J naught, uh, generalized Kähler. And we can solve, um, solve for pluricloused flow, uh, in in the form of a uh, star. So so here, what what I mean by this is this kind of re re gauged version. So so this this is like the star version of pluricloused flow. So and of course I can I can always do this. We had this short time existence result for pluricloused flow, and then I can pull it back by whatever diffeomorphisms I like. Um. So, so I solve this one and I call it say GT uh, IT. 
but then I can also um, so, solve pluricloze flow, let, let me say, uh, for this G naught I naught initial data. But then I can also solve uh, pluricloze flow, um, say, for um, with this initial data G naught uh, J naught. Yielding um, some pair G tilde T, uh, G tilde T. Okay. But so, okay, what's the what's the last thing to check? There's sort of one somewhat a delicate thing to check. Uh, well, a priori, I have maybe two different metrics and two different H's, right? So, so a priori, um, there, we don't know yet that the metrics agree or that um, uh, h tilde t should actually be uh, like minus uh, h of t. Okay, maybe, uh, let, let, actually, let, let me just state this differently. Uh, let me state it as like a DC uh, J tilde T of omega J tilde is minus DC um, I T omega I. A priori, these uh, are unclear. Okay, so we have to actually prove these, right? Um, but the point um, is that I can take, uh, so, so I can consider, I can sort of drop the reference to the complex structure and I can consider G tilde T, H tilde T. This is just a solution of generalized Ricci flow where a G tilde zero is my given G naught and H tilde zero is actually a uh, minus uh, H zero, where I guess I should be careful and, and call this. So how did I do the signs? Um, yeah. This is um, minus DCI omega. Okay. But then I can just do something, um, the, the sort of very simple observation is just to observe that uh, G tilde T minus H tilde T is also a solution to generalized Ricci flow, okay? So this is this is the key point. Let, let me sort of try to get it all on the page. So, um, so what's the point is basically I, um, I solve this system uh, like on the complex manifold with the I complex structure. And then I sort of solve, you know, this, this system on the complex manifold with complex structure J naught. And then a priori, these two parts up here are, are maybe different, right? That's why I call them like G tilde, H tilde, right? Um, but then the point is you, you just look at this system and the, the equation for H is, is linear in H. So if I add a sign, it, doesn't, it's, it remains a solution. Whereas the equation for G is quadratic in H, right? So again, if I change H by a sign, it doesn't change the solution. So it's solving, the point is it's solving the same system of equations, okay? So this is, this is the key uh, point. And the, because now uh, this thing, this is also a solution of generalized Ricci flow with now the same initial data. As uh, GT, HT, okay? because I flipped the sign on the H tilde. Now, now 
right? So so now h minus h tilde zero is is h zero. And so now I've now I've matched up the initial data by sort of performing this artificial sign shift. Okay. So now I can invoke uh, the uniqueness. Tells us so. So by this uniqueness, we know that we're we're getting exactly what what was missing. So so the metrics agree, and also H T is a minus uh, H tilde T, which again, sort of by construction, this one um, is D C I omega I, and then this is minus D C J uh, omega J. So this is exactly <clears throat> this. This is exactly the the condition we need. So is this one uh, okay? I don't know. Um, okay. So. Um, yeah, maybe I just make a sort of a a remark. Um, th this is um, sort of originally how uh, we thought of generalized uh, uh, Kähler-Ricci flow, um, but of course we can we can think of it in terms of the metric and the and the two form B as well. So, and we already. Uh, discussed a sort of two form potential that we wanted to keep around um, for pluriclosed flow. So, so recall that for pluriclosed flow, we discussed, uh, we discussed it in the following form. So del omega i del t minus rho bismuth one one and del beta del t was uh, minus rho bismuth uh, two zero. Well, um, <clears throat> it would be nice to to sort of maybe express this generalized Kähler-Ricci flow at the level of some potential uh, two form as opposed to the three form H. Okay, um, and it turns out uh, you you can you can do that, um, and maybe one way to think of it also is that. Uh, yeah, so maybe there's a few issues linked together. So when I write the generalized Kähler-Ricci flow this way, of course, both of the complex structures are, are changing. But of course, keeping one of them fixed would be preferable. And you, you sort of observe right away that you, you can, if you like, keep one of them fixed, but in most situations, not both. So, so one of the complex structures will have to evolve um, to preserve the, the generalized Kähler condition. And this, of course, is maybe not super surprising from the point of view of these like Hamiltonian type deformations that, uh, that have been discussed. So, so for those, you're exactly sort of letting some special diffeomorphisms act on one of the complex structures to produce sort of genuinely geometrically distinct uh, generalized Kähler structures. Okay, um, but in any case, uh, we, we can also uh, here here if you think about the also the way we constructed this. I mean, I, I took the I took the pluriclosed flows that I was given, and then I sort of put them into this special gauge. So if I want to just bring a pluriclosed flow back sort of down to earth in this way, um, where where um, I is fixed. Then, then the relevant flow for J, well, originally it had this Lie form, Lie derivative with respect to the Lie form of J, but then now it will be the difference of the two. Um, so let me just finish the sentence in a way. Um, So we express this flow of omega i and beta 
as follows. And so, so what we need to tack on to, to preserve generalized Kähler is, is this flow, okay, for J. So here, of course, the, the way I'm setting it up here, maybe just uh, for emphasis, I'll just say di dt is zero, okay? So, so by sort of regaging the system above, this is just the usual pluriclose flow we're used to. And then this is how the J will evolve, okay? And then, yeah, let, let me just say one more thing. Um, uh, when, we, when we express the flow this way, uh, you know, the, the flow of H is, is kind of implicit, right? So we know that H is DC omega. And so if I know the flow of omega, then I know the flow of H. Um, but again, we can, we can get it sort of uh, as a flow of potentials as follows. So, so we note the relevant flow of B where we're thinking of H is its initial value plus DB uh, turns out to be the following. So DB DT well, it's not hard to guess the, the main part. Oh, sorry, there's no one half. So it's negative d star g h. Um, but then there's a somewhat subtle uh, gauge term. So, so plus uh, d theta i, so an exact two form, and then minus interior product with respect to the Lie vector field uh, of h. So it's easy to check. Um, so, so let me make a few uh, remarks about this. It's easy to check that um, H naught plus DB sub T, that if I just call this HT, that this satisfies the equation we wrote before. So, so DH DT is um, Laplacian of H minus the Lie derivative with respect to theta I sharp of h. So basically, you just have to take d of this equation, you get the minus dd star, that will be the Laplacian because h is already closed. Uh, this term drops out, right, when I take another exterior derivative, and then by the Cartan formula, and using that h is closed, this one will convert to this Lie derivative term. So this is a slightly different uh, a slightly different form than what's suggested by just like generalized Ricci flow alone. There, again, there's sort of like a canonical gauging here. We're, we're using this extra gauge freedom of having this, this um, ability to add an exact two form uh, to B uh, and not change H. Um, Why do you add that exact form if it doesn't change the flow of H? Sorry, can, can you repeat that? Why do you add this exact form to the flow of B? Yeah, so um, yeah, the, I, the last uh, sort of piece of the puzzle to, to bring it together and, um, is that in this form, let me get the factor of i right. I guess uh, this, this beta, let, let me decorate this beta with an i as well. This beta sub i um, will be i uh, times b two zero, the, the i two zero part. So this, so so this is like I guess a. Um, there's sort of two claims, I guess. I mean, th this is like one claim, and this is the other claim. Um, so we sort of mentioned this as a as a natural add-on for various reasons, e even though you don't really need it. I mean, it's a funny thing. Of course, you don't really even need to discuss this B flow either. Um, but it's, it's just somehow useful to do so for the analysis. I think we already saw it come up once in the analysis. How was beta defined originally? Yeah, sorry. Like um, beta zero, uh, beta i at time zero can really be, oh, well, I guess it has to be tuned to the initial condition. So, so beta i at time zero is zero, and then, it, and then it solves this PDE. So you solve it forward in time using this equation. And then I guess the, the, the point of this remark is that you can sort of think, if you like, of this beta flow as um, essentially equivalent to this flow of B. Um, but yeah, uh, 
this equation like defines beta. I thought that you had originally solved uh, define the flow for beta so that d of it would give the flow of h. Well, that is also true. I mean, I guess it's a it's sort of a circle. Um, uh, I guess it, here, let me um, just add like a parenthetical remark. It it is it is true that um, uh, let me get the. I guess it's that um, del bar omega t is del bar omega zero. Uh, um, I probably won't get the sign right, but a minus, oh, sorry, I, I messed up, hold, hold on. Um, uh, the del, del omega t is del omega zero minus del bar uh, beta t. So yeah, it is, it is sort of a potential for H uh, in this way as well. I mean, it, it does solve uh, this equation as well. Um, but yeah, like this this beta is sort of fairly explicitly a potential for the churn torsion this way, whereas B is a bit more explicitly like a potential for the bismuth torsion. But of course they're related, right? That's there. Yeah. Okay, uh, anything else? Um, so, um, okay, so, so that's the, that's the, that's the equation. I mean, and at least in this purely uh, like classical formulation, this by Hermitian formulation, this is the equation. But let me sort of further remark, um, um, so, whoops, the question is how to interpret or I guess express this generalized Kalerici flow as a flow of uh, generalized complex structures. Okay. So we, we, we did it for the by Hermitian formulation, but of course, if we would like to do this as well. Um, okay, so maybe I, I write down uh, this theorem. Uh, so, so if I have M a smooth manifold and uh, J1, J2, GK structure, Um, and this can be like a twisted as well, but maybe I won't specify the, the current algebra, right? I'll just specify M. Um, so, uh, so, so suppose, um, J, J one T, um, J two T. Um, is a family of generalized, almost complex structures. Uh, which evolves in a certain way. So, so, um, so DDT J1 is the, this is just, uh, commutator bracket for endomorphism. So is the bracket of J1 e to the k, kt, J1. Um, and likewise for J2, so ddt J2 is the bracket of J2 e to the k, J2. Um, then, um, then J one T, uh, J two T is generalized Kähler uh, for all T, uh, if and only if uh, we have the following conditions. So, 
So one is that K uh, is a one one form with respect to the time T uh, classical complex structure J. Um, this is essentially the sort of like algebraic uh, compatibility. Um, and then the, the integrability condition is that this K is closed for all T. And then of course, the, we, we still have the sort of open uh, positivity condition and we just sort of assume that for all T. So minus uh, J1 T J2 T dot dot, is is positive definite uh, for all t. Okay, so let me um, uh, leave the statement up. Um, Sorry, this one one the first condition it, it is re with respect to which complex structure? Yeah. So um, uh, so. Um, like at, at any at any time t, you you have some uh, like associated by Hermitian structure, and um, like through through this like Galtieri map, and then so that will give you some triple like gij, and sorry uh, I just have one second. Um, Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, so so like at, at each time t, you, you have this like gij associated by the Galtieri map, and of course the but the j is is different at each time. Um, so you assume that one complex structure is fixed, that i is fixed, right? For... Well, um, um, yes. So uh, well, when it's set up this way. Uh, I will be fixed. Um, so actually, wait, yeah, I need to think for a second uh, how this construction sees the difference between uh, I and J. Um, but in any case, yes, it, it is true that with this setup, yeah, the I, the I will be fixed. Yeah, that's right. And so, yeah, I guess uh, this, this we, we arrived at um, basically through uh, brutal computation, um, but uh, in the end, uh, this does seem to be uh, related to these um, um, Hamiltonian uh, flow constructions. I mean, in fact, uh, does this imply that? KT is also one one respect to IT or no no it's definitely not so so this is what of course I'm gonna well okay so to sort of spoil it what what comes next is that the pluricles flow is just given by setting K to be the I bismuth Rigi tensor which of course is not which is J one one but it's not I one one I'm yes confused about what you just said before how how do the first equations distinguish between complex structure i and complex structure j um uh yeah so um yeah i remember this was a sort of a, a delicate point it's uh, there's some there's some tr um, like kind of asymmetry in this Formula. Maybe you add assumption that I should be fixed uh, along this deformation. So you choose case in such a way that I is fixed. Or sorry, um, I guess you, you can do that, yeah. Um, I, I guess you can do that. Uh, sorry, just uh, just a moment. Or maybe as sta as I stated it here, it's not quite if and only if. It's it's more like just constructive. Uh, so 
Sorry, just a moment. Um, Yeah. Okay. I mean, may, maybe I maybe I should add it as a as an assumption. Um, yeah. Sorry. Uh, zero is just that i t is i zero. Um, uh, actually, yeah. Sorry. It's it's escaping me now how how the construction is supposed to see that because if I state it this way, it's not really right to say it's if and only if anymore. Um, um, sorry, just a second. Isn't it automatic that one of them is going to be constant? Uh, it is, yes, uh, it is true, yeah, that one of them will be. Um, but I, I, I remember we... <laughs> We we struggled over this when, when we wrote this paper, and I but I've I've forgotten now. I mean, I guess the point is that th this should this formulation should somehow have an asymmetry to it that picks out J versus I, and I'm forgetting now exactly what that mechanism is, right? Because uh, it, it's to do I think with the conventions and how you define the Galtieri map, I guess. Uh, okay, yeah, sorry. That that yeah, that that is what it is. Uh, it, it looks like like there's no like there's no difference here. But basically, in in implicitly in making this identification that gives you G I and J in the first place, there's sort of a, a choice in that map, and somehow the these do just automatically pick out I over J. Like I guess I guess my point is that yeah. So so in in making this identification between. J1, J2, and the bi Hermitian data, there is an implicit ordering on the complex structure, on, on the two complex structures. And this, as we wrote it, does pick out like the second one. Yeah, sorry, Th thank you, Francis, that's, that's right, yeah. It's a very delicate thing. Um, yeah, because when, when, I, when I write it here, it doesn't really look like there's any difference, but, but there is because you're implicitly making a choice in, in, this, the in this theorem of Marco. Does that help? So, sort of, there, there is, I guess, yeah, the bottom line is that uh, they're not actually equal in the eyes of this Galtieri theorem. One of them comes first and one of them comes second. Um, so, okay, yeah. Uh, so, so this, um, this gives you these sort of, um, it's a natural class of, of deformations than of generalized Kähler structure. Um, and then maybe I just, uh, yeah, as a, as a remark, um, for such deformations, um, um, actually, I guess I forget now how much this has come up so far. Um, but we have, uh, of course, these these Poisson tensors, a sigma t. So 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 this is uh, one half g t inverse uh, bracket i j t. So um, this this in general defines uh, a real Poisson tensor. Associated to any uh, GK. I mean, I wrote it as a family, but it's just um, if you just have any any generalized Kähler, this defines a real Poisson tensor, which has some further structure. So, <clears throat> in particular, it's type a uh, two zero um, zero two um, with respect to I. So it's a section of wedge two two zero zero two of the tangent bundle. Um, but also, of course, with respect to J, so wedge two zero uh, zero two J T. So it's of type two zero zero two with respect to both I and J, and it's also sort of holomorphic in the two relevant senses. 
So d bar i of sigma to zero i equals zero and d bar j sigma to zero j is zero. Okay. So sorry, I didn't I didn't finish the sentence. So um, yeah, so so this is this uh, real real Poisson tensor which is associated to any GK structure. And now of course we have a, a family, um, a one parameter family in principle of such Poisson tensors. Uh, but in fact, this is sort of part of the background. Sigma t is just sigma zero for all t. Okay. So so these this this type of deformation occurs uh, completely fixing this this Poisson tensor sigma. Okay. Um, okay, and then the 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 theorem we can state now um, is as follows. So, um, so suppose uh, M two N G T I J T. Is a solution to this generalized Kalarici flow in the I fixed gauge. Um, then you get an associated flow of, of J1 and J2, and it turns out to be exactly of the above type. So DDT J1 is bracket J1, where the deformation you're using is the I bismuth Ricci. So E to the row I J1, and then DDT J2 is the commutator of J2 with E to the row I J2, okay? Okay, so. and maybe I, I didn't use this this I fixed gauge terminology, um, but that's what I mean. Uh, that's what I mean by this. So 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 this uh, this system, if you like, is generalized Kalarici flow in the I fixed gauge. Okay. So again, I, I know I already said it, but um, for this for this general system, you know, the way I initially wrote it, everything moves, but of course you may as well just gauge things back so that I is fixed or one of them anyways is fixed. And when you do that, you can think of the system uh, in this way, or I guess all of these together, you can think of the system in this way. Um, and when you do that, uh, you you get the flow of the generalized complex structures as follows. So you use here that rho i is of type one one with respect to j. Yeah. So there's kind of something, I don't know, to my eyes, somewhat miraculous to this. The way that the, this bismuth Ricci tensor sort of exactly gives all these nice properties to to fit to fit this this type of deformation. Yeah. So so. Um, sort of lurking behind this. And, and these are sort of, if you like, consequences or also how, why, uh, con they're either consequences of the theorem or um, they're just sort of part of how you prove it in the first place really, um, is that uh, this rho bismuth I is in fact a one one tensor with respect to J. That's true in general. Um, uh, and also uh, along this generalized Kalerici flow, the Poisson tensor is uh, is fixed. Okay. So I guess this kind of fits with 
what Marco was saying about sort of um, what is kind of like the holomorphic background of of deforming generalized complex, generalized Kähler structures. And, and I guess the point is maybe one should think of this Poisson tensor as part of the holomorphic background and and indeed, the, the flow seems to respect that point of view. Um, so sorry, Jeff, I have a question. So for general K, uh, some tensor might change. Is it correct? Or it's also fixed? Well, uh, no, for, for oh, what I, okay. okay. So for, for what I wrote in the theorem, no. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I see, you're right, right. Okay. It's definitely fixed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, in fact, maybe something we can get to the bottom of maybe in this learning seminar is that I these, I guess, are perhaps yet still part of a larger deformation coming out of like what Francis was talking about. Um, Marco, Marco, Marco has a paper actually about these deformations. Yes, uh, I forgot exactly the title, but it's something like Hamiltonian flows and it's called generalized scalar metrics from Hamiltonian deformations. Right. Um, and yeah, it seems, uh, I guess you can even let K like have an imaginary part, right? And this gives some other. Yeah, if K is imaginary, it gives a, a B field transformation, I think. Okay. Yeah, I had meant to sort of mention um, this this integrability dk equals zero here it might seem like well that's just the usual thing for like a, a b field transform preserving integrability of generalized complex but it's not it, it's somehow just not it, it's genuinely different the, these things are i don't know they're they're just not uh, b field transforms um so uh um it, this this integrability it, it somehow just comes from a different place um So yeah, but I guess so the the e to the k is only multiplying on the left, right? The j one and the j two. It's not to conjugating. Or... Yes, yeah. There, there's a number of like signs you have to get right. I guess if you put it on the right, it's like adding an overall sign to the right hand side. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of these conventions you have to pin down. Yeah. But yeah, it would be interesting to see if if this point of view can be used to sort of produce other other natural PDEs for generalized Kähler. I mean, this Bismuth Ricci fits exactly these somewhat delicate uh, conditions. Um, well, I guess they're not so delicate. I mean, you need you need a closed form, but then you also need something that sort of naturally is one one with respect to your inevitably moving second complex structure, I guess. And again, this bismuth Ricci just sort of does that very naturally. Um, okay, so um, um, I think that's maybe all I wanted to say about, oh, may, maybe, yeah, maybe I just make a further general remark that this point of view kind of gets you. Um, so we can ask now, what is like, what is the GK con or what are GK classes? And uh, for us, the point of view uh, we took after, after sort of looking at this, um, so you can, of course, further restrict to the case where k happens to be like uh, exact, okay? And so, um, so, so we can say, um, say j1, j2 uh, is equivalent to some second pair, j1 tilde, j2 tilde, If they are connected by a family, a one parameter family, as in the theorem, 
Okay. So we can think of this as kind of a, I mean, not, not really an equivalence class, but, um, uh, and then, and then you can think of equivalence classes as as being like the the GK cone, and um, uh, maybe I just say equivalence classes via uh, exact deformations. So, so if I just say they're they're not just connected by a family, but a family where the K is exact at, at all times, uh, you can think of this as the like GK class. And maybe just for emphasis, this definitely does directly generalize the the notions of of Kähler class and Kähler cone. So, so when you do this deformation starting at a Kähler structure, you're exactly if if k is if k is exact, uh, you're 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 producing um, the Kähler class. You're you're just deforming within the Kähler class, and in fact, you can achieve the entire Kähler class by deformations of this kind. And conversely, or um, if you if you just assume k is closed, you can kind of fill out the whole Kähler cone by deformations of this kind. Okay. So I think it's somehow a, a very clean and simple way to generalize what these things should mean uh, in the in the GK setting. Um, and for all of them, yeah, this this Poisson tensor sigma is just part of the background. Um, okay. Uh, and then I guess uh, tautologically. Uh, from, from what I said, um, we note that this generalized Kähler-Ricci flow uh, preserves this uh, GK cone, okay? And you can sort of specialize, so, so we discussed this kind of general idea of the, the way the existence theory goes for, for Kähler-Ricci flow basically as long as your class stays in the Kähler cone, you should expect it to exist smoothly. You can imagine something similar. So, so we also discussed uh, how to make that like a, a rigorous formulation of such a conjecture for the pluriclosed flow, but now you can make a, a sort of very rigorous uh, conjecture for, um, for the generalized Kähler case as well. So as long as uh, um, the flow is remaining in a, sort of in this generalized Kähler cone, it, it should remain smooth, okay? But I actually think it's a, it's a really interesting question um, how to characterize this cone, by which I mean something like this sort of like Moishazan, Moishazan criteria. And also, um, like, what is the global structure of this space? So probably it's not uh, quite right to even call it a GK cone because, of course, it's it's not a, not a cone necessarily, obviously. Um, and and because because these deformations uh, naturally have some nonlinear structure to them, I mean, you sort of instantly un fully understand like the topology of of the Kähler cone on a Kähler manifold because it's uh, you just have this nice linear structure underlying everything. But here is no longer the case. So even a single generalized Kähler class, it's not really at all clear what the topology of that should be. So like for instance, uh, these uh, like. Hamiltonian deformations, I guess, that we discussed of Joyce and Vesti and has come up again and again, like taking a hyperkähler and deforming it to something generalized Kähler, it's not at all clear what the full structure of, of that whole, uh, of this sort of associated generalized Kähler class 
is. And in fact, alternatively, the point of view we sort of take is that you can think of the generalized Kähler-Ricci flow as a tool for answering that question. I mean, alternatively, you can think of generalized Kähler-Ricci flow as a tool for taking an arbitrary element of that class and hopefully flowing it down to something canonical so that you can then understand the, the, the global structure of this space, which is um, basically like a certain subset of Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms of some underlying symplectic form. In, in, in the case I described. Is it, is it clear if this notion of a Keller class agrees with the one by Francis and Marco and, and Sapsin? I think what we define is smaller, right? I think you allow for more, Francis, is that right? Um. I think it's very similar, but I forget exactly. I there guess I, I was under the impression that maybe we were considering like a subset. I, I guess uh, uh, not completely sure. Um, th this was just sort of the, the type of deformation we sort of arrived at by kind of grinding away at, at various examples that we knew and this Galtieri map just kind of, you can just sort of, discern this type of structure and it and it sort of magically fits the generalized Kähler Ricci flow. So from the point of view of like understanding this PDE, this seems like the sort of natural deformation class. But I think maybe there maybe this slightly or well I don't know this sort of bigger class I, I think is bigger maybe includes some more interesting deformations. But I'm not sure. I, I think um this the Kähler cone, which corresponds to varying with closed K, that, that corresponds to to uh, changing the Morita equivalence. Okay. And then the exact one, it just corresponds to moving the the submanifold. Oh, I see. And when you say changing the Morita equivalence, that means like changing the underlying like Poisson geometry sort of or the the holomorphic Poisson structure um is fixed but you know you have the two holomorphic Poisson structures and you have this space that relates them yeah. and that that space uh that space can change there's actually a it's it forms a group it's like a, a, to, a topological group and uh so so you're kind of flowing in that in that group I see. Is it clear how these Hamiltonian flow deformations fit into this E to the K picture? Uh, yeah, I can say fairly explicitly. Um, just one moment. Uh, yeah, I may, maybe I should also just say, yeah, this this came out of a work I did with a with a student here. This is all in this paper that we wrote. Uh, Matt Gibson is his name. But maybe I just also reference. Um, and also this older paper of Marco. So this paper of Francis, and then also this paper of Marco that, that Francis just mentioned. Um, but yeah. Uh, um, so, so I guess uh, infinitesimally, <coughs> um, um, so, so the simplest case of this, of this Hamiltonian flow construction um, so, so here we, we have uh, G I J and then sigma again is one half uh, G inverse the commutator of I and J and then omega is sigma inverse. Um, so, so I'm assuming sigma is invertible. Um, so, so how do these flows look? Um, so uh, yeah, so if we assume um, uh, phi T 
are omega Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms um, generated by um, some smooth functions, ut and c infinity. And I forget exactly my convention, but of course I just mean um, like you say xt is uh, sigma d ut and then dt da is xt. Uh, then, then you get a GK structure <clears throat> um, by just sort of you, you fix omega for all time, you fix I for all time. So whoops, um, I, I T is, is the original uh, I. And then you, and then you pull back J, right? So, so JT is V T star. So this is the construction, and um, so as above, uh, what you take is k at time t is d j t d d t. So this is this is precisely the k, and you you use this k in the formula above, and you and you get. Uh, what, well, in any case, that, that's how big J1 and big J2 are evolving. And this would probably generalize to, to this more general construction Francis was uh, talking about, which depends on one form rather than a function. Um, sorry, which, sorry, which depends on a one form, you said, instead of being exact? Yeah, in general, to generate uh, this Poisson structure. Oh, oh e yeah, one form, you take DC of. Oh, uh, one, one, yes, one. So sure, surely that's correct. Yeah, you're, you're just saying XT is like sigma alpha. And then here I would just get DJ uh, alpha, I suppose. Yeah, I, I'm surely that's right, yeah. Um, okay, yeah. Um, all right, so, all right, two, 210. Um, yeah. So I guess it, in in what follows, I, I wanted to sort of specialize this discussion to at least a couple settings. So I guess we already discussed a little bit of, well, what this thing looks like in the in the non-degenerate case. Um, uh, yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I'll just say a few words. So um, so. So now that we have this basic structure behind us, so what kind of long time existence uh, can we expect? And also, um, how does this underlying Poisson tensor sigma affect uh, the flow equation? So. So it turns out, a, it, well, it sort of looks quite different, I guess, depending on the structure of, of sigma. Um, and the, the first case I want to consider is something I, I don't think we've discussed at all uh, really here, which is this uh, commuting case. So, um, so here, what, what do I mean by this? This is M2N. G I J uh, generalized Kähler, and you assume that this sigma is uh, identically zero, which is, of course, if and only if uh, I uh, commute. Okay, so so these two uh, commute, and it turns out that there's uh, quite a lot of nice structure in this case. So we let, um, let Q be um, minus uh, IJ. So, so what does this tensor Q have? Well, you can check that Q squares to 
um, positive the identity endomorphism of the tangent bundle. And so uh, Q yields uh, plus minus one eigenspace splitting of the tangent bundle. And, and that splitting uh, respects uh, the various holomorphic structures too. So, so we can really say that the, that the one zero um, tangent bundle with respect to I can be expressed as uh, T plus a direct sum T minus where uh, um, where um, this is precisely where I equals, uh, these are like directions where I equals J and here's where I is uh, minus J. Okay, so I, I think I got the signs right. So 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 basically the point is it be, because of this um, because of this structure of, of I and J commuting, uh, I has to equal and the fact that they're both complex structures, uh, I has to equal plus or minus J um, on every vector. And so basically you're, you're splitting up uh, the one zero tangent bundle with respect to those two subspaces where I is equal to J or I is equal to minus J. Okay. Um, and I guess, yeah, and the, the basic structure theory here, I'm sort of referring to this uh, paper of, of Vesti and Marco. Okay, so they sort of first worked out all this basic structure theory. Um, and yeah, maybe uh, before before discussing much further, I'll just point out um, some nice uh, examples that we have. Um, so the point is that uh, well, this structure gives a, a splitting of the tangent bundle, and so so the simplest examples you can get are just like products of Kähler manifolds. So if you have M one or M I G I. J I uh, Kähler, then you can say uh, you can let M be be the product M one cross M two, and G is the product metric. But then I can form uh, like two uh, two complex structures. So so I uh, is maybe J one J two. And J is um, J1 minus J2. Okay, so you can just sort of change the orientation um, of one of the factors to, to get the second complex structure. And um, this is, in fact, uh, a generalized Kähler structure. Of course, it's kind of um, maybe not super interesting because it's actually Kähler in the end, um, but you can actually deform this to. Uh, to produce a non kähler uh, examples. More interesting is to is to consider quotients. Okay, so you can also put this structure on on hop surfaces. So here I just think of the the simplest kind where I take C two minus the origin and mod out by the the group generated by um, alpha z1, beta z2, where um, magnitude alpha less or equal to magnitude beta is less than one. And right, so, so this inherits a, a complex structure from, uh, from C2, so, so, so I, could think of as this standard like two by two complex structure. Um, so this is uh, thought of as a four by four matrix on, on like R4, but then this J, th this would just be the standard complex structure, but then I can change the orientation of one plane. So J200 zero, zero minus J2. Here, I, I'm just literally writing things in the natural coordinates where J2 is zero, one, minus one, zero. 
or sorry, I, I want maybe the other way. Okay. So the point is, yeah, this complex structure I is, is what naturally descends. Uh, well, well, this is just the complex structure for C2, which, which descends to the quotient. But the point is this J does as well. OK. And we can take this, this standard uh, Hopf metric. So, so maybe let me also fix now that the magnitude alpha is magnitude beta. Um, then I can take the following metric, which is just this like uh, Hopf metric, which is easier to define in terms of the Kähler form. So, so the Kähler form is I over uh, norm Z squared dd bar the norm Z squared, which of course, this is just um, norm Z to the minus two times the Kähler form of the of the like usual flat metric on on C2. Okay. So or maybe I'll call this omega hop. Okay. So so this metric uh, this this metric is is compatible with with both of these. That's easy to check. Um, and so, and it's also invariant under this under this group action. So, so it descends to the quotient, and you can check the um, G hop I J is a generalized Kähler, and then of course the sigma is is zero, right? Because it's obvious that I and J commute as endomorphisms. Okay. So is this example okay? Uh, and maybe I'll just remark um, um, via this construction. I guess what I just mean is uh, sort of taking products and then quotients uh, is what I mean by this construction. We can produce examples on a most non kähler complex surfaces, for instance, on these uh, in a way surfaces. Maybe I change most to, to many. So um, yeah, you, you cannot blow up them. So right, yeah, no. it's it's a bit, uh, yeah, it's it's actually it's a bit restrictive. Of course, this like splitting of the tangent bundle is a fairly restrictive thing, and and I guess maybe I'll just further remark that um, in this paper that I mentioned, Apostle of Galtieri essentially classified. I mean. Classify the possible underlying pairs um, IG. Okay, so like which which complex manifolds can occur and and what can the possible J pairings uh, be? So they um, when n equals two. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, and uh, maybe the the fourth remark. Uh, about this, and this is again, this is all in in Apostolov Galtieri, is that there exists here a natural scalar potential theory um, by which I mean, so so of course, in, in Kähler geometry, you can at least locally express your metric using one function and then the natural way to deform generalized Kähler, uh, the natural way to deform within a within a cohomology class is just by like using the DD bar lemma and moving by a function. Um, and so how does that look here? So um, 
so basically the claim is that um, um, locally, so if I have G, I, J, um, uh, first of all, um, sorry, let, 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 me, let me state it differently. Um, we first note that the splitting of this tangent bundle yields uh, a splitting of, you can think of it also as a splitting of T star and hence a, hence a splitting of the D operator. And again, so, since, the, since the splitting of the tangent bundle is compatible with the holomorphic structure, in fact, you get D is del plus plus uh, del bar plus plus del minus plus del bar minus, where each of these, right? So, so the point is you, you sort of, you can think of the complexified tangent bundle or cotangent bundle as now having a fourfold splitting. So there's the usual one, zero, zero, one splitting with respect to one of the complex structures, but then the second complex structure is splitting each of the one, zero and zero, one bundles according to this eigenspace decomposition of Q. And it's again, just it's just sort of according to the sign of J on these, on these different factors. J either agrees with I on, on, it agrees with I on some subspace and is minus I on a different one. Okay, and so, so that's, that's what this splitting of, of D is, this, uh, this fourfold splitting. And then so using this, the point is now locally, um, we can express, say the I Kähler form as follows. So this is I uh, del plus del bar plus minus del minus del bar minus of some potential function F. Okay. So actually, I guess this, this is not actually quite in apostolov Galtieri. We, we prove this in the book, but what, what they prove is just that you can uh, perturb, uh, if you have a given structure omega i, if you, if you perturb by a right-hand side like this, you're preserving all the structure. But in fact, you, you can show that locally they're all expressed uh, this way. And what took me uh, maybe far too long to, to understand is that this has a simpler expression, of course, already the hints are there, is that this is actually just d d d c j of f so again there's this funny mixing where, where like the the right differential operator for like what's going on in the i complex manifold uses the j complex structure and vice versa it looks funny but but basically this this difference this funny minus sign here is exactly uh compensated for by just taking the the ddcj operator okay And already, of course, again, there's a very uh, what I what I think is a very nice question. Um, what is the global analog of the DD bar lemma in this setting? So right, so in the Kähler setting, we, we have this global DD bar lemma. If you have any two metrics, any two Kähler metrics in the same class, they, they differ by DD bar of a function. It ought to be the, the case that by fixing the right underlying cohomological data, and it's not exactly clear what that is, but if you, if you fix somehow the relevant cohomological data for, for two GK metrics of this type, um, then they should differ by globally by a potential of this kind. Um, but it seems like a delicate point because the, the, the proof of DD bar lemma, of course, requires like these Kähler identities in a sort of delicate way. And so, um, yeah, so it's, it's an open question. Uh, okay. Um, and yeah, let, let me just actually, in, in a more concrete way, uh, mention what I what I briefly said above, 
which is just that if I'm given uh, omega i associated to g i j, where these commute, then um, omega i plus uh, epsilon i del plus del bar plus minus del minus del bar minus f um, um, defines a GK structure for a sufficiently small epsilon. Okay. I just need to preserve the positivity, right? I mean, the, the point is all the integrability is being preserved by, by this deformation. I just need to preserve that it's positive. So I add this epsilon. Okay. So, so we have sort of like a global version. I mean, you can perturb globally by a function and, and get GK, but, but still it would be nice to sort of completely claim that any two any two GK where, where sort of some relevant cohomology classes are fixed uh, differ by by this thing, by some something of this kind. Um, okay, so uh, uh, maybe yeah, let's see. It's getting a little bit uh, late. So 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 maybe. Um, Maybe I'll just sort of give a, a remark uh, for next time. So, so, with this in mind, uh, we might expect this generalized Kähler Ricci flow to reduce to a scalar flow when this commutator is zero. And um, it turns out, in fact, this is true. And maybe I'll just end by writing down what it looks like locally because it, um, and then we'll sort of see how to globalize it properly next time. Um, and locally, If we express, say, omega i as in this form, so, so omega i at time t is i del plus del bar plus minus del minus del bar minus of some function uh, uh, u sub t, then the relevant, uh, the relevant PDE for u is as follows. So del u del t. And again, I'm working locally, so it won't look like I'm writing down a, a scalar. So, so del u del t should be a log of um, i del plus del bar plus u uh, to the k, where that's just the whatever the top power is, divided by minus i del minus del bar minus u uh, to the l. So, so k. K is the rank of T plus and L is the rank of T minus, okay? So um, what's the point uh, with this equation? Of course, of course, I mean, the Kähler world sits inside generalized Kähler in, in many ways, but in particular, Kähler world sits inside this picture by just setting the rank of one of the, like, like the rank of the minus bundle to just be zero, right? Then I equals J and everything is just Kähler. And then this is exactly like the complex Mongean pair uh, equation locally. This is just like the local formulation of complex Mongean pair. But here, um, what we have is this kind of, well, we have these like two kind of partial Mongean pair type operators, these two partial determinants, the determinant of the, the, the Hessian in the plus direction and then minus, the, the determinant of minus the Hessian in the minus direction, okay? So this looks like a somewhat uh, strange equation maybe. So we call this uh, twisted uh, Mongean pair. 
Um, and maybe just a, a simple sort of PDE fact is that this is still, of course, elliptic, but again, it is not convex. No, it's, it's neither convex nor concave. So again, we have this sort of delicate uh, PDE subtlety uh, in this, where this is, um, in fact, it's mixed convex concave. So, so it's a, it's, it's a con concave operator in, in like the plus uh, variables and then a convex operator in the, in the minus variables, as it turns out. So in any case, uh, this thing, I think it's one of the first times I've seen a PDE that sort of has this kind of mix of, of convex and concave structure coming up like globally on manifolds, but it happens very naturally uh, in this GK setting. Um, so yeah, so I guess uh, may, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll stop there and next time I'll discuss how to make this uh, global and then I'll also discuss this scalar reduction in, the, in this like non-degenerate case, in this case where the Poisson tensor is invertible. Um, so, okay. Thanks. <laughs>